An anonymous late, uh, late 15th century poet says this of Christmas. Here have I dwelt with more and less from Hallowtide till Candlemas. So Christmas used to begin on the 1st of November, All Hallows or All Saints Day, and it finished on the 2nd of February, that's Candlemas, the presentation of Christ in the temple. Three months of Christmas, so more or less the same as now, just separated by <laughs> about a month later than these days. But now we tend to marginalise what used to be grand feasts during the 12 days after Christmas. Um, St Stephen, 26th of December, St John the Evangelist, 27th of December, the Holy Innocents or Childermas on the 28th of December, St Thomas of Canterbury on the 29th of December, the circumcisional feast of the holy name of Jesus on the 1st of January, and Epiphany on the 6th of January. Yet, St Stephen's Day fueled this. Good King Wenceslas looked out on the feast of Stephen. And the feast of the holy innocents created this. Unto us a boy is born, King of all creation. And Epiphany led to this. We three kings of Oriental, bearing gifts we travel so far. The 1st of January is these days known less as the day on which Jesus was formally given his name and more as New Year's Day. And still, in the new year, you can witness this sort of thing. Now, the word wassail came from Old Norse via Middle English. I would say wassail, be in health, be in good health, and you would respond, drink hail, drink health, and so we would drink. A description of wassailing is found in Geoffrey of Monmouth's early 12th century history of the kings of Britain. And the Saxon maiden, Ronwyn, offers the British warlord Vortigern a cup of wine. She simpers, wassail. He stammers, drink hail, and the seduction is swift and massive. This is Geoffrey of Monmouth in the early 12th century. But what's fascinating to me uh, is the chronological sweep of that story. So you have Geoffrey of Monmouth writing the early 12th century. He takes the story from three centuries before his own time, and the events themselves date from almost four centuries before that. So there's seven centuries distance in all from the thing that he's reporting. So what Geoffrey of Monmouth does is he introduces the recent Wassail Protocol into this storyline. And also Geoffrey of Monmouth names the Saxon Maiden. So what Geoffrey does is he takes a familiar story, that's to say, exotic young woman seduces powerful man. He adds a custom of his own time, that's to say, the sharing of the wassail cup. And he gives the protagonist a local name, Ronwyn, in order to place the story where it needs to be on the English-Welsh border in this case. And these three things, I think, are important. Recognition, modernization, and relocation. In other words, you select popular heritage material, you dress it in modern garb, and then you drop it into a local context. And that actually describes the history of many of the carols that we know and love today, the sort of reason that you get snow uh, in the Victorian pit, for instance, but you can see how it happens. Recognition, modernization, and relocation. And Carolization is the currently ungainly title that I've got for it. I will uh, rethink it, um, and I feel sure that the anthropologists um, can help me out here. So form an orderly queue. I expect to be deluged afterwards. Anyway, that word will change, I feel sure, within about an hour. Anyway, to return to the music, within the early medieval church, during the build-up to Christmas, special significance was given to the so-called O antiphons, or great antiphons. These O antiphons all begin with the exclamation O. All address Christ using a different image from the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament. And all entreat Jesus to come, veni. So here's the first of the great antiphons, O sapientia, and we'll hear it now. Amen. 
you can see a list of the seven great antiphons. And the images there are powerful, reverent, and venerable. As I say, they all use a different image from the book of Isaiah, from the Old Testament. O Sapientia, the one we've just sung, wisdom. O Adonai, Adonai is the Hebrew name for God. O Radix Jesse, root of Jesse. Jesse was the father of King David. That's to say the first in the genealogy of Christ. O Clavis David, key of David. O Oriens, morning star. O Rex Gentium, king of nations. And O Emmanuel, which is an Old Testament name meaning God with us. And the initial letters of these seven images form the acrostic S-A-R-C-O-R-E which when you turn it backwards is E-R-O-C-R-A-S, two Latin words, ero crass, I will be present tomorrow, which is, um, whether, <laughs> whether deliberately or not, um, an appropriate preface to Christmas Day, ero crass, I will be present tomorrow. Carol is a medieval word with Greek roots. It means a ring dance or a dance song, and it's derived from the old French word carol, and note that Carol was never a Christmas song, that was Noel. Noel is specifically a Christmas song. Carol is this ring dance or dance song. And the word Carol eventually comes to signify any joyful song or hymn. Now, in uh, Randall Cockgrave's A Dictionary of the French and English Tongues of 1611, so we're at the early 17th century by now, the French word Carol was defined as a kind of dance wherein many dance together also a carol or Christmas song. So there you have it. You've still got the old meaning of the dance, the ring dance, but you've also got the idea of Christmas creeping in as well. But that's by the early 17th century. Here are some medieval carolers. You will notice that they're coming this way, and that seems to be the standard way of doing it, the clockwise direction of these ring dancers here. This image is from about 1400. Now, in a strict formal sense, a carol is a stanzaic song with a burden. Now, this burden, this is a couplet that appears right at the opening of a carol and after each verse. And this burden is the cue for general cavorting. Now, the burden is a refrain with bells on, and quite literally, if you can imagine the dance. So, the burden is not a refrain, it's a special refrain. It's something that comes at the beginning as well as after each verse and at the very end. So it comes right at the beginning. But crucially, the burden tends to be a self-contained expletive that adds to the mood, if not always, to the narrative. In other words, if you get a refrain, that generally continues the story, whereas a burden is just this outpouring of whatever is appropriate to the particular carol. Now, you need to bear in mind when you're thinking about this ring dance that the Latin participle stands meaning stanzing, is what the chorus does while the leader sings. So the leader sings the stanza while the dancers stand around, and then when the burden comes, they all go in their circle and, uh, as it were, ring the bells and so on and so forth. Now, this burden might be uh, an evangelical Noel Noel. It might be an ecstatic AR AR. In another context, it might be a soporific Lule Lule, or it might be a robust Rola Rola which uh, there may or may not be uh, a connection there between rola and carola. But anyway, this burden is an important uh, aspect of the carol as distinct from a refrain. In the history of his kings of Britain, Geoffrey of Monmouth, which I've just mentioned, at the, in the early 12th century, Geoffrey of Monmouth, I think, makes this beautiful reference to the standing stones at Stonehenge in Wiltshire as the giant's carol, which I think is beautiful. You can see there, there's a couple of had a little bit too much. A couple of the giants have fallen over during the course of the ring dance. But I think it's a very, very powerful image of this being the giant's carol, the giant's ring dance. This idea of Stonehenge as the petrified ring dance, I think, is a very, very beautiful image. Now, the first extant songs in English to survive with music and words intact are by Godrich of Finkel, uh, who lived, we're not exactly sure, but could have been born around 1070 or 1080, and died in 1170. Anyway, the important thing is he flourished sometime in the 12th century, so around about the same time that Geoffrey of Monmouth was writing his history of the kings of Britain, uh, Godrich is doing what he did, and he wrote three songs. And the crucial thing about these songs that Godrich wrote is they are in early Middle English. So I say these are the first extant songs that are in English and that survive with music and words intact. 
This is the third of them. It's not a hugely long song, but it is an important, very, very important historical event. Um, Godrich was an unusual man. He was a hermit. He was born in Norfolk uh, into poverty at the time of the Norman invasion. But he became a successful merchant seaman and he traded in precious goods. But then he turned his back on that life and he became a hermit in Finkel a few miles north of Durham. Godric lived mainly off roots, berries and leaves, although later on he did cultivate a few vegetables. But I think that was, um, that was the only pleasure he allowed himself, was to grow himself a few vegetables. And he deliberately deprived himself of sleep. When he did sleep, he slept on bare ground. He wore a worm-infested hair shirt made of rough Northumbrian wool under chain mail. He prayed while totally immersed in the perishing water of the River Weir. You just have to imagine that, <laughs> praying in the water of the River Weir. And just in case he couldn't make it to the river in time, he kept a tall barrel of cold water nearby for emergency immersion as a distraction from temptation. This was a genuine, genuine hermit. And seemingly, in spite of his lifestyle, seemingly lived to be over 100 years old. So maybe there's something we can all learn from that. Goddard's songs are the oldest surviving songs with music in the English language. And their texts, the texts of his three songs, deal with Christ, Mary, and St. Nicholas. And that the songs are in English rather than Latin is unusual, particularly given that Godrich could speak some Latin. That is what you'd expect him to do, and he could speak some French. You might even expect him to write in French. But no, he wrote these three songs in English. And it's particularly remarkable because Godrich came to compose these songs given that he was, as he said, omnino ignorus musicae, in other words, altogether ignorant of music. So here's a man that doesn't know about music who is nevertheless composing songs. These songs came to Godrich in a series of visions. And one of these songs, I say, is offered to, the one you can see here, is offered to St. Nicholas, or Santa Claus, as we know he became in the 19th century. Now, when Godrich was a young man, the cult of St. Nicholas uh, received a shot in the arm in the West. Uh, Nicholas's remains were moved, translated from Turkey to southern Italy. This was a good thing uh, in European terms. And as the patron saint of merchants and seafarers, St. Nicholas was obviously ter terribly important to Godrich, because that's what Godrich had been when he was a younger man, uh, when he'd been a commercial sailor. Anyway, so one of his songs is to St. Nicholas. Um, these songs are freely composed plain chant, essentially, with English words. So they're songs with English texts, but they're modelled on Latin chant written by a semi-literate East Anglian hermit living in the north of England in the years following the French invasion. And this is a, reflect, a reassuringly eclectic genre, and certainly in the, the, the reason that I love, as some of you know, the reason I adore the carol genre is precisely for this reason. It's got so many things uh, bound up in it, but as I say, English texts based on a Latin idea, somebody born in East Anglia that moves to the north of England at the time of the French invasion. This is what's going on uh, in Godrich's mind. Um, uh, and this song, I mean, I, I won't do it justice in every way, either vocally or certainly in terms of the early Middle English, but I'll, I'll give it a try. Um, I'm slightly shooting myself in the foot by allowing you to see it as I do it. Sancta Nicolas, God is truth. Timbra us fara shuna hus, at the bortha, at the bara, Santa Nicholas bring us vildara. It's a little bit cod, but I think it probably gives the idea of what's going on there. But the, the point here is that it's very definitely in English, and while based on Latin plain chant, has a particular feel that is an English song. And crucially, uh, it's offered to St. Nicholas. Um, given what I was saying about carolization and what happens to a lot of medieval carols is that we can't leave them alone and we have to bring them up to date. So obviously I was going to do my own job on this. So taking this Godric song, which is about St. Nicholas, therefore I adopt that, recognizing that St. Nicholas has to do with Christmas. Um, I modernize it by uh, adding uh, certain harmonies. Uh, and, and relocate it right into sort of modern Christmas terms. In other words, I'm going to do a sort of modern job in it to make you think that it's a kind of modern carol, but nevertheless, I'm having translated it into modern English. But this is what it comes out as when you do that. <laughs>
it's what we do uh, to Carol's. I, it, of course, that would have had Godrich racing straight for his barrel of freezing water, I have no doubt, being something completely unrecognisable to him. There are just a few surviving songs from 13th century England, and one of them has achieved, uh, achieved particular fame because of its mention by Chaucer. Chaucer wrote the Canterbury Tales at the very end of the 14th century, and the second of the Canterbury Tales is the Miller's Tale. Nicholas, again the name, Nicholas, the clerk of Oxenford, an impoverished scholar, is hailed for his intellectual prowess. And at lines 27 to 30, we learn that, and all above, there lay a gay psaltery on which he made a knight's melody so sweetly that all the chamber rang and Angelus ad virginem he sang. Now, Angelus ad virginem is a gem of the 13th century uh, and it tells the colourful story of the Annunciation of the Blessed Virgin Mary. The angel Gabriel announces to Mary that though a virgin, she will conceive a child who will be called the Son of God. And what's extraordinary about this is exactly the kind of reference that people looking at these uh, connections love, because this means that a century and a half after Angelus ad Virginem was written and was in its heyday, it was still being quoted by Chaucer. A century and a half is a long time for something to remain, as it were, top of the pop. So it went from a marginalised kind of tune into something that had actually been ratified as part of the liturgy and actually became part of the mass. But anyway, here it is, uh, uh, as bold as you like, in Chaucer. There it is in its um, pneumatic guise. Ad virginem, as the clerk of Oxenford um, may or may not have, loan, have, have known it. In an attempt to show you what's going on, I've actually completely obscured the text, but underneath uh, the red highlighter there is what we've just sung, Angelus Ad Virginem in Latin. And this is another great testament to how popular this song was, is it gets translated into English. And that's what I've highlighted here in the yellow. So you've got five verses in the Latin, which this particular scribe has then written out for us in the English. And bless him, this scribe made one fatal error, which if you knew anything about the two languages, that's to say, if you know anything about um, Middle English and anything about Latin, you'll realize there are about 30% more syllables in English than there are in Latin. And this is made very obvious. So he does quite well at the start, as you can see, and then gradually, <laughs> he rather runs out of space and the English one really goes off the end here. But, it's a, but it, it, it makes the point nicely um, that actually you do need to be quite a good uh, poet to be able to make English fit the same music as the Latin does and indeed that's what this tune did so lots of interesting things and, and particularly interesting to see it here and particularly interesting that the scribe made us aware of the difference between the languages um, so evidently here. Um, in modern English Gabriel sent to the sweet maiden from heaven's king brought her blissful tidings and began to greet her eloquently hail to thee full of grace indeed. Now, medieval rhythm is a thorny issue, um, which the notation is frequently silent about. It's not clear from the notes on the page there what rhythm you should apply to it. Uh, and these days, when people sing that melody, as we just have now, we tend to do it in that jaunty compound duple meter that you probably recognize as something we these days regard as thoroughly medieval. That's not necessarily the case. We just don't know. Um, my former supervisor, Mark Everest, who's now a professor in music, at the University of Southampton and a musical, musicological legend. He describes this modern performance practice that we've just done it as cantus dictus sagittarii. I'll give the Latinists a moment. Cantus dictus sagittarii. 
signature tune of the Archers, which Mark in his cod way, and that seems to be the thing. That's the da, 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 da. That's the way in which we tend to rhythmicize all this medieval music, although there are six different rhythms in which we could, but we tend to focus on that mode one, um, as I say, which we recognize as Barrett Green um, in the way, uh, in, in certainly from the end of the 20th century onwards. There are the words. Now, we're not purists here, and nor were they purists in the medieval time. So you've got a good tune, which is in Latin. It's so good, you want to translate it into the vernacular. What do you do next? You add another voice part. probably ahead of me now, but in the 13th century we had the single line. By the beginning of the 14th century we add another line, and yes, by the time you get to the mid-14th century, I, what I love about modern technology is you can scrawl all over priceless manuscripts. I've, I've deliberately done that untidy. I just, I, I, I love it. Um, anyway, but that I, th I hope shows you, so what you're about to hear is those three voice parts um, on two systems there. Uh, good luck with following it. Um, do notice, interesting, that there were, we're on four line staves here, not five line staves, because the, brilliantly, this is very singable music, because the range doesn't go above an octave in any of the parts, and as a consequence, it means that actually could be sung by a number of different people, and that strikes me as being quite an important thing about uh, this music at this period, is actually it is music of the people much more maybe uh, than it has become in certain institutions. But anyway, so, add another part. purism in the history of the carol they did it to themselves there's no reason I don't see why we shouldn't do it to them as well all of which is putting off the moment of truth which is the identification of the earliest surviving true English Christmas carol I'll help you hand by hand we shall us take and joy and bliss shall we make that's what you have at the top uh, your verse here sort of four lines down a child is born among man, and in that child was no stain. So it's Christmas, it's a carol, there it is with its burden, and it's in English. It's a true Christmas carol, a stanzaic song with a burden. And also it looks to be based on a non-religious model. Again, a wonderful thing for the carol. So it's not just come from a religious background. It's been nabbed from somewhere else and relocated and modernized in its own way. It mentions Christ's birth, a proper Christmas carol. And it was copied out in around about 1350 by a Franciscan monk. The Franciscans were very good at Christmas. The Franciscans realized that what you really wanted for Christmas was to make sure that this music was relevant to the people in the same way you imagine sort of stained glass windows doing their bit, teaching people um, the stories. This, that the music was very useful. So take, this was St. Francis's idea, take these popular tunes and make them, get, pl you know, plug them onto something else. And in this case, Christmas. Uh, the catch, though, uh, is that there's no music that survives for this one. So it is a genuine English Christmas carol but there's no music attached. But things are about to get better. 
Who? This is the earliest surviving Christmas carol in English for which music does survive. Lule, lule, my dear mother, lule. As I lay on Eula's night, I alone in my longing, I thought I saw a welfare sight and made her child rocking. Lule, lule. Uh, this is a huge, absolutely huge, um, I think there are 37 verses in this carol. And it's quite an odd structure. So essentially, the poet's lying in bed on Christmas Eve, uh, Christmas Day evening, uh, and he has this vision. First of all, he sees uh, Mary and Jesus. And Jesus says to his mother, tell me all about you uh, and how I came to be here. And she goes, well, there's not much to tell, really. You think, well, that's a slight understatement. But anyway, that goes on for several verses. Um, after which, uh, Jesus, the, the baby Jesus then begins, begins to predict everything that's going to happen with his life, um, culminating in the crucifixion and the resurrection. And then the last verse, which I find particularly telling, uh, is um, when he goes, um, yet yeah, certainly this sight I saw as I lay on Christmas Day. So he finds the last verse, he finds that he needs to justify that he did genuinely see this. And it wasn't just a sort of Christmas vision that might have been provided by, shall we say, other forces acting on him. He says, this is a genuine religious image that I had. Anyway, but this is our earliest English Christmas carol with music. <laughs> Moving on to the 15th century, there are 125 carols that survive with music, and the majority are in triple meter. Now, about uh, three quarters of your 15th century carols are about Christmas. Um, there are only three named c composers of carols in the 15th century, Smart, Child, and True Love, and the major sources of the 15th century carol survive uh, from East Anglia, Windsor, Worcester, and Devon. So four main sources, three composers, lots of anonymous works, 125 carols, three quarters of them about Christmas. Now, the oldest of these um, is the Trinity Roll, 
and this is the most quirky of the 15th century carol sources. It's kept safely in Trinity College, Cambridge. It's over six feet in length. Uh, and the interesting thing about this Trinity roll was that it wasn't designed to last. It was how basically you disseminated music or text. You rolled it up and it meant you could put it into a satchel and you could, you could travel with it and then somebody took it and they copied from that. But actually, brilliantly, it has survived all this time and is still kept in Trinity College. As I say, it's about six feet in length, but it really was meant to be an exemplar and it wasn't meant to be in any way something that survived. But we have it and brilliantly, it means that some uh, of the carols on it, are, are the, it's the only source for them. Um, a man called John Fuller Maitland had been an undergrad undergraduate at Trinity College, Cambridge in the 1870s, and he made a transcription of the carols. And then he engaged his friend and former teacher, William Rockstro, to add extra voice parts to all of the carols. Um, now, I think about 30 years ago, this is the kind of thing that struck me as absolutely horrific. You find this wonderful two and three part music, and then you add a bass part to it and an alto two part to it. Now I think it's a wonderful thing to have done. So in this publication, you get the original transcription of how it looked like. And then he says, yeah, but it might these days sound like this. So we'll sing you a brief extract of a carol, There Is No Rose, in its original two part version. And then what right at the beginning of the 20th century was deemed to be an acceptable way to serve this up. As I say, something that I found horrific about uh, three decades ago, but now in my data, I'm finding it actually really rather beautiful. <laughs> now with its early 20th century harmonies. At any rate, it shows um, a, a love of, uh, of the genre and just wanting to, to add something to it that makes it relevant to the 20th century. Here's one that um, you might know. I don't know if you can make it out there at the top. Deo gratias Anglia Rede Pro Victoria. This is right at the centre of the Trinity roll. That's to say about three and a quarter feet in. Um, and this is the famous Agincourt Carol. And this is, uh, as was quite common in the 15th century, a macaronic carol. In other words, it mixes two languages, in this case, English and Latin. So it begins, Deo gratias Anglia rede pro victoria. Give thanks to God, England, for victory. I mean, the wonderful thing about this is that we can actually link it to a time and a place. The place clearly is England, and the time clearly is 1415, the, the victory um, at Agincourt. Give thanks to God, England, for victory. And then it goes on. Our king, that's Henry V, went forth to Normandy with grace and might of chivalry. Their lords, earls, and barons were slain and taken, and that full soon. Give thanks to God, England, for victory.
rousing victory song, proving that just like puppies, medieval carols are not just for Christmas. So I say only three quarters of the 15th century carols are Christmas ones. Other ones are moralistic tales or, for instance, for St. Stephen, uh, other for, for Easter, or indeed in this case as the celebration, a national celebration of a victory. Also, um, from the 15th century, um, here's a, uh, a carol taken from the Ritson manuscript. And just before I left home, I remember to bring this. If anybody wants to uh, leaf through um, the images in the Ritson manuscript, I've left it here. Please do. It's mine so you can turn the pages, do what you like with it. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful thing, and I urge you to do so. Um, the Ritson manuscript is 22 folios. It lives in the British Library. Uh, additional manuscript 5665, and it was donated to the British Library in 1795 by an extremely bad-tempered man called Joseph Ritson. Uh, and the most colourful carol in the Ritson manuscript is Noel, Noel, This Boar's Head. Uh, now, this, uh, this Boar's Head carol is by a man called Richard Smart, and it's known as the Exeter Boar's Head Carol because Richard Smart was indeed uh, a singer at Exeter Cathedral. Um, but what's interesting about this is, while clearly Smart was a singer at the cathedral, there is no way that this carol, which is clearly designed for the refectory, clearly designed for the hall, would have been used in church. So it tells us a little bit about what these carols were for. And in my belief, they certainly weren't for inside the church. They were probably to be sung by those people that uh, sang, them, sang in church, but not actually to be sung in church itself. The boar's head we bring with song in worship of him that thus sprang of a virgin to redress all wrong, Noel, Noel. Noel, 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 Noel. The boar's head that hath been beaten, beaten, the Exeter Boar's Head Carol. Here's another example of the Boar's Head Carol. This is written down by a man called Richard Hill, who was a, a London grocer. Richard Hill's commonplace book is a wonderful thing. He just loved writing stuff down. So the first thing he does, he writes down all the London churches. And then he writes... Uh, long treatise about breaking in horses and tree grafting. I don't think of any other reason. He just actually liked the business of feeding his pen on the paper, and why not? But brilliantly, amongst the receipts, annals, histories, chronicles, commercial and statistical dates and tables, family memoranda, an account of the Lord Mayor of London's show, an English-French vocabulary, poems, prayers, and other verses in Latin as well as English, humorous and satirical pieces, ballad songs, and carols, all of which were clearly important to this lovably self-important grocer in the years between 503 and 1536. And one of the things he does is he records this particular boar's head carol. The head of the boar I bring while singing praises to the Lord is the Latin. That's the burden. The boar's head in hands I bring with garlands gay and birds singing. I pray you all to help me sing. It also appears in print. And the Boar's Head Carol has the distinction of being the earliest extant printed Christmas carol. It survives on a single leaf. The rest of the book doesn't survive. In 1521, by Jan van Winken, who you might also know as Winken de Werder, or however, but anyway, this is Winken de Werder. Uh, he was the first person, or the, what we have, the first surviving printed uh, English carol. I say it's English, but it's also half in Latin as well. The, the, the burden is in Latin. Um, and this boar's head tradition uh, still carries on to this day. I was fortunate enough 
um, 2013 to 14 to be acting director of music at the Queen's College Oxford where they hold the Boar's Head ceremony even now. It'll be happening this Saturday on the Sunday, uh, Saturday uh, nearest to Christmas. Um, Hugh uh, was also there two years ago. He's, he sung it as well and it's really quite, a, uh, quite an event. This is how it used to be depicted uh, and the Boar's Head, a genuine Boar's Head was brought into Hall. Um, what the Boar's Head um, uh, um, um, celebrates is a 14th century Oxford student. Uh, so when Queen's College was quite new, this 14th century student was walking outside Oxford in Horsepeth uh, and was rushed by a wild boar. And uh, the only thing that he had on him was his Aristotle. So he thrust his Aristotle into the boar's mouth and killed it that way with the slightly redundant um, Grecum est, it's Greek, he said, as he killed the boar. Anyway, um, waited till after mass and went back to Queen's. And as I say, the, um, the, uh, the tradition continues to this day, and it will be happening this Saturday. As I say, I was lucky enough to do it in 2013. Um, rather disappointingly, in the senior common room in Queen's, uh, this ridiculous... I mean, this is the only reference in the rest of the college, the only reference to the boar's head. Um, it, this is in the SCR at Queen's. Uh, anyway, as I was lucky enough to do it. Um, it, the, the, the wild boar on the left, Carol boar on the right, just in case you're uh, <laughs> confused. I love the fact that I kept the, 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 the date, date line on it just to be absolutely sure that you know where it is. That's, well, the head isn't real, but I think they've done a pretty good mock-up job. Uh, and there we all are jostling uh, for position before we go in. Um, Our steward hath provided this in honour of the King of Bliss, which on this day to be served is in Reginency Atrio. That's in the Queen's Hall. Uh, here's the music from the very early 20th century, um, and this is how it's sung to this day. Our steward hath provided this in honour of the King of Bliss, which on this day to be served is in Reginency Atrio. <laughs> <laughs> 